Okay. Okay, well, today is the next to the last class on Marx and Engels. You will say all oh, when you come to Durkheim next semester. Yes, but we, as I said before, we will never leave Marx and Engels for the rest of our lives. Marx and Engels are actually living around us. You know, it's, it's, I think that our president must have taken 101 because he and the Treasury Secretary are following the rules of Engels, Socialism, Utopian and Scientific. Do you know that they had an idea of simply, remember? Bailing out 700 million, just given to the bankers. But they've changed their tune. Has anybody noticed how their tune has changed? What they are doing now, what they decided over the weekend, Neil? We're, uh, they put like undersecretary, somebody's in charge of a committee that's going to decide. Ah, that. committees, yes, the great bureaucracy, yes, in DKT. They're using it to buy banks. They're doing, they're buying banks, they're investing their money in banks. The state is doing what? It's beginning to take over the banking industry. But that is normally called what? Hmm? What is that normally called in most places in the world? Nationalization. Do they call it that here? You wouldn't know it's happening if you look at the newspapers. That is a dirty word in this country, nationalization. We are supposed to be in a world of Adam Smith with self-regulating markets, but it turns out that they are willy-nilly, despite themselves, having to actually take over the banks, which is precisely what Engels says will happen. And not only that, Chrysler and General Motors are thinking of actually doing fusing, combining, amalgamating, something that Engels says on... What page? What page? What page? Forming trust, but actually, what page is this? Oh, page, get those tuckers out. Where are they? It may be hot, but it's not too hot to get your tucker out. (laughs) 700 and what? 710. Well done. Who said that? Conrad, Simeon. Yes, 710, 11. Those are the pages. Bush gets up in the morning and reads these two pages now every day. (laughs) It is amazing. Amazing, amazing, amazing. Yes. It says at the top bottom of page 710, we've read this many times. In many cases, with trust or without the official representative of the capitalist society, the state will ultimately have to undertake the direction of production. Ha <laughs> ha! Including banks. You can't, you didn't see that, it's invisible. Um, this necessity for conversion to state property is felt first in the great institutions for intercourse and communication and banking. The post office, the telegraphs, the railways, and the banks. Yes, interesting. Anyway, you can read those pages many times. And it is amazing. It really is amazing how parallel the situation is between now and the one described by Engels in Socialism, Token and Scientific. But, but we will see there is also a problematic character in the writings of Engels and Marx on this matter of the crises of capitalism. Okay, so in order to understand the problems, we're going to summarize what I did last time. Let's see. I'm going to remember we had a big picture for those of you who were here. We had a big picture, a big picture, and I'm going to summarize the big picture as follows. Competitive capitalism. What is competitive capitalism? Competitive capitalism is not other than a capitalism in which there is a lot of competition amongst capitalists. Capitalists are competing with one another, and in the process of competing with one another, what do they do? They introduce simplification. They introduce new technologies. They introduce family labor. And the result is? The result is? (laughs) 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 Very good. Very good. (laughs) Touche. (laughs) Yes. Very good. The result is, yes, indeed, communism. Finally, communism. But the immediate result is... Polarization. Polarization. Basically, what happens is that workers are thrown out into reserve and unemployed. They're de-skilled. They become poorer and poorer. The capitalists get richer and richer. There is polarization. And that leads in two directions. In the one direction, it leads to crises of overproduction. Crises of overproduction. And in the other direction, it leads to class struggle. In the one direction, the crises of overproduction get deeper and deeper, according to Engels. And leads to what? The concentration of capital. The disappearance of small capitalists, they disappear and they fall into the working class. And so there are fewer and fewer and bigger and bigger capitalists. Concentration of capital. And down here, what happens? Class struggle leads to class struggle, leads eventually to the seizure of state power. Seizure of state power by the working class. And... Bob's your uncle, they seize state power and introduce communism, which has already been founded on the concentration of capital, because here we also note the increased character of planning. We're already moving from privatized appropriation, private appropriation, plus socialized production, until finally we go to socialized 
appropriation plus socialized production. And this process of concentration of capital is already the beginnings of socialized production. That's the story we had last time. That's the story we had last time. And the question is, what's wrong with it? Now we have to ransack. What's wrong with this? What is wrong with this picture? We are not in communism. Even though, what's your name? What's your name? No, it's absolutely you. Our latecomer who came. You know, well, yeah, right. You were probably organizing for communism. That's why you were late. But what's your name? Jessica. Jessica. You're always Jessica. Yes. I've seen you many times before. Yes, Jessica. Yes, Jessica. Yes, well. What do you think's wrong with this? What do you think's wrong with this? Any thoughts? Any thoughts? We not, you know, despite your intervention here, we're actually in communism. This didn't happen. Well, look. I, well, I'll tell you. It really did happen. It nearly did happen. In fact, if you actually look, if you actually look at history and study history, you will find before the First World War, in the period from 1890 to 1920 in Europe, there were indeed, there were indeed a lot of crises, but usually of a more political character. And it did look as though socialism, communism, for now they're the same, did look as though it was on the agenda historically in Germany and Hungary. And of course in Russia there was a revolution. Yes. So they weren't completely off the mark by any manner of means, but the fact of the matter is we are not here in communism in this country or anywhere near it. Or anywhere near it. So what's wrong with this model? What's wrong with this theory? Yes. Okay, Jessica. Um, no, you stuck your hand up then, didn't you? I, kind of, I just kind of feel like communism... Well, I don't want to say anything wrong, but I feel like communism technically like, leaves out... Okay, all right, right. This is the one criticism. One criticism is, you know, this is not a viable, feasible type of society, which is what you're about to say. Fine. We talked about that before. I want to know what's wrong with the rest. Why we didn't arrive here? Why didn't we arrive? What's wrong with that? Other aspects of the world. We've already had some criticism of communism. And you can have lots of chances to criticize communism in your papers. But yes, Neil. The, uh, the line between seizure state power and Right, so seizure of state power, and that's what we call this Bob's your uncle theory, that's really questionable. And what we're going to discover is that in Marx and Engels, they don't have a reasonable, they don't have any theory of transition from capitalism to communism. Well, we'll see that a little bit more when we talk on Thursday about the preface, which you should read five, ten times, it says, right, ten times. And that's a zero, ten times. Um, but yes, that's right, that's right, Neil. There's not much of a theory, that's why I was joking about this Bob's your uncle theory, so immaculate conception communism, ICC. Um, you know... It's not clear how this all is going to happen. So that's one criticism. Yes, Jason? It's a little simplistic the class struggle. Right, so that's another step here. X, Y, Z. Why? How is it that class struggle leads to state seizure, seizure of state power? What does class struggle actually lead to? Class struggle. We Marx and Engels seem to be thinking that class struggle leads to more class struggle, leads to more class struggle. What does it actually lead to? What happens when class struggle takes place in history? Ah, uh-huh, yes, KT. Revolution against the bourgeoisie. Well, yes, that's a possibility. A revolution against the bourgeoisie. And in that case, you would have a seizure of state power. But there hasn't, haven't been many seizures of state power. I mean, you know, Russia, you might say, is a case of that of the working class playing a role. It was, of course, as you remember, in a society that was largely peasant, so it didn't really have the consequences that were, in, that were intended. But, yeah, it's... Yeah, does the working class become revolutionary? Does, is the uh, American, the U.S. working class revolutionary? Is the U.S. working class revolutionary? Uh-huh. Okay, so what's wrong with this theory here? What happens when workers engage in struggle? What do you think happens? Christy? Capitalists make small concessions. Ah, very good. Capitalists make small concessions. I like this. Small concessions. Not even concessions. Small concessions. Like, for example... Raising Raising wages, yes. Giving health benefits, yes. Anything else? Anything else, Neil? Shortening of the workday, the so-called factory acts of the 19th century, yes. Anything else? What else happens when workers engage in struggle? Historically, over 150 years, what do you imagine? What do workers struggle for? Yeah. What sort of state intervention? Well, what did the Wagner Act do for working class? Well, yes, so building struggle in order to pass legislation that would allow workers to organize themselves into trade unions that would defend their interests. Aha, uh-huh, yes. Yes, anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Anything else? Anything else that the working class struggles have generated? Yes, anything else? Anything else? Anything else, Simeon? Um, historically, a closer and closer association with the state. That is to say, identification with the state, and that if the state represents the Wagner Act or if the state is doing this thing, that instead of opposing the capitalist state, where it will then 
as a representative so-called of its so-called of their so-called interests yes that may be the case yes do you think that the working class in the United States today thinks the state is on its side well in cases like you're saying of the Wagner Act uh, majorly uh, I mean that was kind of yeah the so yeah but I said today I said today I said today you're squirming around there Simeon Ah, you're hedging. That's okay. You can hedge. It's a theory course. You can hedge on the empirical details. Jenny, you had your hand up. I would say also, class struggle leads to division among workers, like racism, the fight for American resources. <laughs> ah, yes. In fact, what happens is that class struggle, how does class struggle lead to divisions within the working class? Very good. How does it lead to it? Yes, you said it. Well, I think, you know, there's scarcity of, of jobs. So, like in one of the articles, we had to pay for this in the term, there would be less and less jobs. So we, we look at people who are illegal immigrants and we say, well, we're not going to fight for better pay for them because they're illegal. Aha, uh-huh. so certain groups successfully struggle and get those crispy small concessions and other groups are left behind and that creates divisions which then become organized sometimes as racial divisions, gender divisions, citizenship, immigrant divisions, non-documented, undocumented, documented division, all sorts of divisions can. So uh, therefore you do not get a white class, a quartz class, you don't get a a, 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 a unified class, a united class. Yes, very good. Very good. All right, so you get the message here. Class struggle actually leads to these concessions of all sorts that improve the conditions of the working class, whether they be concerned with social security, pensions, whether they be concerned with some increased standards of living for certain fractions of the working class. What does it be to do with minimum wage? Do you know where the minimum wage is in, this, in California? Eight dollars. Do you know what the federal one is? Six fifty-five, isn't it? Six fifty-five. I think so. Yes. That's right, Vegeta. Right? Yes. Yes, 655. Yes, anyway, some, some states don't even have minimum wages. You know that? As I was discovering when I was looking at the figures. But basically, they have actually gone up. And of course, it's very often, a, you know, it's, it's observed in the violation of the rule law there are than. But there is a minimum wage. Working class has fought for it. And for the factory acts. And even the electoral competition. Fighting for trade unions. And in some countries, fighting to organize political parties that campaign for improvements of working conditions. In this country, we don't have a Labour Party. We did once. So there was even a Socialist Party. But they don't seem to exist anymore. It was any sort of real sense of the word, in my view. Um, but in other countries they do exist so there have been under capitalism class struggle has actually led to concessions and that perhaps explains why it didn't lead to the seizure of state power okay that's a very important criticism and we're going to have to examine this theory of class struggle that Marx and Engels have where are we going to go? we're going to go to the Communist Manifesto in a minute okay right so we've said no theory of transition false theory of class struggle what else? Juliana? Well, Without that class struggle, so this arrow becomes questionable, because this one is questionable. But what about this? And what about this? What about those two? Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Hmm. Well, what does happen with these crimes? Just suppose, or let's, let's follow the other side of the story, Juliana. Okay. You say because there's no seizure of state power, the concentration of capital doesn't give rise to communism. But instead, we have concessions. So what's the significance of concessions? For, up there. What are those concessions? Well, the first concession you said, Christy, was what? Increasing wages. What is the significance of increasing wages for this top line? For this particular thing? Come, 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 come Alex. Hands up over there. Uh, hmm? Alex. Is it Alex or Lars? See, but Alex's not there. I can't distinguish between the two of you. Lars. Yes, well, one way is that, you know, what, how do they fix production? Like, for example, with diamonds, there's where, like, a lot of diamonds, and uh, so they went together and they just put the diamonds in, uh, in Switzerland and then they take only, like, a very little part of it and sell it. So they have to ah, so they were carefully regulated production, like OPEC. We talked about the oil cartel last time, right. What else? What else happens? Yes, indeed, yes. That's right, that's right. So by increasing the wages, by increasing wages, they are able to absorb some of the surplus. Right, Anders? Yeah? Look as though you've been to a capitalist board meeting today. No, okay. No, okay, right. Yes. So, ah, all sorts of ways in which, what happens? All sorts of ways in which the consuming power of